Welcome to a odd video in the sense that I'm going to do a Cruz versus Dillashaw Pulse Fight video. Not going to do these too often because time, basically. Um, but some interesting things happen on this card and it's worth talking about and seeing what the reaction is. Um, also, I can talk about um, a little thing I want to go on about, um, about the different ways we enjoy fights and how we have to take that into account of our perception. So, stay tuned for that at the end. Or if you just want to hear about the fights, uh, you don't have to. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom. And someone asked me why I started at the bottom. I started at the bottom because the beginning of the video is where everyone's watching. If you do the main event at the beginning of the video, you lose a chunk of the audience. Maybe you lose a chunk of the audience by starting at the bottom as well. But at the end of the day, I want to draw the attention to the bottom fights because... Something that has gone very poorly in UFC history is that very few fighters have been able to make a name for themselves. Um, people get excited if they're in a main event. They don't necessarily get excited if they're further down the card. This despite the fact that there are quality fighters throughout the card. Um, and why this is a problem is, is that it's why UFC fighters have no real leverage position in terms of money. Because people don't care if they leave. They won't follow them. Um, so the UFC doesn't have any incentive to really sign them. And as you lose stars, like for example, the 170-pound division is a good example of this, where they lost GSP and went from being like a talked-about division to the one that had a pay-per-view main event that was just an afterthought, uh, or just one car to go, to a lot of fans. So it's bad for the UFC to have this whole not being able to create stars, and it's bad for the fighters because they don't have any real grounds to do anything and to me it's bad for the fans to a certain extent because I mean when are we at our best we're at our best when we when we have someone to cheer for when we're someone we or someone to cheer against whether it's whether it's we have a, a hero in the fight or we have a villain in the fight that's when we have our best and when we just don't know when people are just kind of like vanilla meh we don't really care um, like Rafael Dos Anjos for a long time was a, a don't care for most people. He was a care against Pettis and a care against Cerrone because of who he was fighting. And it'd be nice if every fighter could be a care at some point. Anyways, at the bottom of the card, we had Francis Barbarossa versus Elvis uh, Mutapsic. Didn't see the fight. Um, I missed the first... Uh, I missed basically most of the... Uh, most of the prelim fights. Um, I did see Paul Felder versus Darren Crookshank. Um, and I did get to see Rob Font versus Joey Gomez and Eli Latifi and Sean O'Connell because they were replayed during the broadcast. But I was making uh, chicken wings for me and my roommate. By the way, PC chicken wings, really good if you're a Canadian. Um, just stay away from the butter flavors. They're not so good. Um, since I didn't see the fight, I can't make a comment on it. I'm going to, I have I have an idea of how it went. Um, I probably won't go back and rewatch it. Um, I know that kind of goes against the how we want everyone to fare, but there are fighters that will never, no matter what, get to this dance. That Burroughs is a is a classic example of this. His his fights are boring, and you don't you don't feel like he's really heading anywhere as a fighter. And there's not you know there's not a reason to care. Like we're never going to get to the day where all fighters we care about. But I'd like to get it to a higher percentage. Rob Font, Joey Gomez. That was that was a pretty good fight. Um, it was interesting to see Font cracking out takedowns uh, against Joey Gomez. Handled his business. Looked really good. Um, still kind of lacking that that really key fight that really tells us a lot about him. Just because George Roop was such a a really impressive bad matchup um, for Roop against Font. And then Gomez, of course, a UFC debutant. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to see where, where Font goes from this. And I'm excited where Gomez goes from this because the, a lot of the concerns people have about Gomez, specifically about cardio and stuff, didn't really seem to come into play. He did he did well. He was losing the whole time, but he did well, like for a debutant. Let him develop, and there could be something there. Charles Rosa beat Kyle Bochniak. Again, didn't see that fight. Um, again, I, I can probably see it in my head how it went, but not going to really comment about it. Ila Latifi knocked Sean O'Connell out in 30 seconds. Uh, there's not a lot to talk about here. Latifi is very, very powerful. Uh, his striking looks 
better. Apparently he's been training with ATT a little bit. That'll help. Um, not much else to say for O'Connell. Uh, ends a two fight winning streak. His protests that he wasn't out were somewhat ridiculous. Um, so good performance from Latifi. Back to the drawing board for O'Connell. Uh, where would I like Latifi to go after this? I don't really know. I mean, he's such a short, light heavyweight that it's hard to see. Like, he's immensely powerful, immensely athletic. Um, not, not immensely athletic, but more than the average two or five in athleticism. But the problem is, is that we've seen in the past he can be kept to the outside and his lack of height just comes into play against him there. Uh, the Jan Blackowitz fight is a, a, a pretty um, perfect example of this. He wants to do a fight in Malmo if they go there to his hometown. Um, I'm down for it. I don't think there's a specific opponent I want to see him against, but uh, I'll be interested. Paul Felder, Darren Crookshank was fun. <sighs> Darren Crookshank is, a, is an interesting fighter because as much as I don't think his old style that he came off the Ultimate Fighter with and kind of beat, you know, fighters who either didn't really belong in the UFC like Henry Martinez and Chris Dickel or fighters who were just kind of done with their careers like Eve Edwards, you know, getting old. Um, it was exciting and it was different. Um, now it's like every time he gets hit, he's looking he's looking for a takedown and not really realizing that he's not a great wrestler and he's not a great grappler. So I'm not really sure what that's supposed to do for him. I think like Crookshank is like an example of a fighter who has to really go back to the drawing board and figure out what he can do um, to fix his fighting career. For Felder, it's a good win. It's a notable win. He has better wins. Um, I think the Danny Castillo fight probably is his still crowning achievement in terms of victories. The loss to Ross Pearson hurt. The loss to Barboza is not a big deal. We'll see. Like Felder is a fighter who he still has some improvements to go if he's really going to become a permanent staple of the lightweight division, but he can probably do it. So let's see what he can do with that. Luke Saunders had a good fight against Maximo Blanco. Maximo Blanco. Someone described Maximo Blanco as like an autistic fighter. Uh, I, it makes sense. Not, not in the sense that he is autistic, but his fight IQ and ability to even like remember rules is just so low. There's so much technical and athletic ability in Maximo Blanco that if you could. Figure out a way to get him to be a smarter fighter. Not necessarily a person, but a fighter. He would be a scary, scary proposition. Um, this was another fight where it, it didn't come together for him, even though a lot of things were looking good. Um, it's a big win for Luke Saunders. I mean, you come in, you fight up a weight class from where you normally fight. You are an undefeated fighter, although somewhat lacking in terms of name value. Uh, of opponents, so I'm kind of I'm I'm very interested in Luke Saunders' next fight, and that's or Sanders Sanders Sanders, um, which could not be said before. Um, he's very talented, very athletic, very smart, uh, or at least compared to Blanco, smart um, fighter who can do a lot of different things, and at bantamweight, a, a division that desperately needs it. I don't want to call him a prospect because he's already 30, and that just seems a little bit too old to be a prospect. But And, like, do I see him making a title run at any point? No. But I could see him as a top 15 talent, which Bantamweight is in desperate, desperate need of. So it's a good signing and a good debut. Chris Wade made me bad dead. Not much to say. Chris Wade went out and did his thing. Um, <sighs> kind of a new age John Fitch. A little bit in the sense that he's, you know what he's going to do, but he's good enough at it that most people aren't going to be able to stop him from doing it. And I don't think it'll necessarily win fans, um, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what, what comes of that. For Mengi Bad Dad, um, he's a late notice replacement, so he'll get another chance. But I think almost everyone on the card at, up to this point that had lost... It wouldn't surprise me if we didn't see again, um, just because of where they are in their careers. Like, 
I, I really want to see Blanco again, but his UFC run has been very frustrating. Sure, this is one loss in a row after three wins in a row, but the three wins were against guys who probably aren't long for being employed if they've not been cut already. Um, every time he stepped up and had a real test outside of basically Sam Cecilia, he's lost. And he's done so by like DQing ways and just frustrating fights. And I don't know. It's just, he's just. He's not a guy that the UFC like. Hardcore fans love Blanco, but we're the we're the guys who are going to be watching the fights kind of regardless. They're like nothing, our opinion doesn't matter to the UFC because there's no money in pleasing us because we're gonna pay our money anyways. And that's the type of person that Blanco appeals to. I don't know if he appeals to the masses. We'll see. Uh, Tim Boch at Herman. Disappointing. Um, Boch at this point. Retirement seems like something he really needs to perhaps seriously consider. Um, he's lost three fights in a row. Um, and they were three fights that, truthfully speaking, he could have won. Uh, I'm not going to say should have won because Talos Latis is like a resurging talent who, who probably was favored to win that fight. And I think probably a lot of people picked. But Dan Henderson was like a gift wrap fight for him. Ed Herman was like a perfect matchup for him and he couldn't get it done and you're starting I'm starting to really struggle to see who he can get it done against um, Fred Herman it's a win it keeps him afloat I think at 205 he's going to have a hard time um, but we'll see it, it's a new day for him maybe he won't be nearly as slow um, Patrick Cote Ben Saunders it was a good fight uh, Cote coming out on top uh, for Saunders Bit disappointing to see him get knocked out, I guess. Um, we'll see what he can do. We'll see if this is a sign that the chin is going or that the toughness isn't there anymore. For Kote, it's a nice renaissance he's had. He's not going to be a title contender because I think he's a little too old for that and I think not particularly fast enough and so on. But the ground game is improving. His ability to strike and not just rely on power has improved uh, drastically. His fight IQ is higher than it used to be. Um, fantastic. Uh, Francisco Trinaldo Ross Pearson is a fight better. Just it says more about the decline of Ross Pearson than the rise of Francisco Trinaldo, in my opinion. Uh, Matt Mitchell on Travis Brown, ugly fight with the with the eye pokes and the eye thing. I a good win for Brown and a, and a, a terrible thing for Mitrione. But I this is what I don't get. Like every time we get an eye about poke in that fight, it was like this type of thing, like this pushing off thing. I I don't get it. Like. You know, I've never fought at a high level, but I've had my like schoolyard fights and my sparring matches and my amateur fights and whatever. And people claim that this is a natural reaction to someone trying to punch you. I don't see it. I've never been tempted to do that to somebody's face. Pushing off, I push off of the body, or I punch, or I block and cover up or something. I don't know. It, it's they keep claiming it's not deliberate, and I'm not in your head. I can't say it's deliberate, but I mean it, it's getting ridiculous because certain fighters do this a lot, and, and not necessarily Matt Brown, or not Matt Brown, Travis Brown. Sorry. Um, and he'll get more hate on this because of the Rousey thing. It's kind of like Brian Caraway. It's like we hate Brian Caraway because he's with Misha Tate. No, we don't. We're just more aware of the shortcomings and sort of debagness of Brian Caraway because he's with Misha Tate. It's it's correlation, not causation. There we go. Um, Eddie Alvarez beat Anthony Pettis in a less exciting version of what I thought that fight was going to be, but I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you can pressure and deny Anthony Pettis space to make things happen, you can beat Anthony Pettis. You really can. He doesn't handle that well. He does not handle it when you dictate how the fight's going to happen. He goes into like full-on takedown defense mode, but he's not punishing you. He goes into... Um, no, that's more of the problem, but like he, he, he has taken steps to improve areas that people said were bad. Like when Clay Guida beat him, it's like, okay, you got to improve your takedown defense. But if you improve your takedown defense and you stuff takedowns and you do nothing else, you don't win the fight. And that's the stage he's at. He needs to get past that point. Otherwise, for a guy as talented and as physically impressive as Anthony Pettis, he is an easy guy to beat. That doesn't mean everyone can beat him. I'm just saying that the blueprint is there. 
You have to be a fighter who can take some punishment. You have to be a fighter who has some athletic gifts. But if you have the, if you can check those two boxes, you can be Anthony Pettis, despite the fact that he is a spectacularly promising fighter. And maybe I, I don't know what the answer is. Is it a new camp? I don't know because Duke Rufus has never really taken a fighter to these heights before. But in fairness, that doesn't mean he can't. And the relationship between coach and fighter is incredibly important. And Pettis apparently has a very good relationship with Rufus, which a lot of people did not have. Um, we'll see what happens. He's not done by any stretch of the imagination. And could he be a future lightweight champion again? Maybe. He know. Let's put it this way. What he has to fix is obvious. And now he's just got to find a way to do it. Uh, Dominic Cruz versus TJ Dillashaw. I scored this 1-2-3 for Cruz, 4-5 for Dillashaw. I could see scoring the third round for Dillashaw. Actually, I guess that, that, that phrase. I can see it. It's not what I would do, but I can do the meth mental gymnastics to say, okay. Uh, I can even do the mental gymnastics to say a 5-0 because sometimes judges have gotten crazy with the whole, we reward aggression and always aggression. As long as you're moving forward and not even connecting, we will reward that, which is stupid, but it happens. What I cannot think is that the one judge scored this four rounds to one for TJ Dillashaw, and I don't see how. Because your most dominant Dominic Cruz rounds are rounds one and two, and they're almost the same round. If you showed me round one and then you showed me round two, and you didn't tell me it was round one and two, I would not necessarily... Like, if you reversed it, if you had showed me round two... And then round one, I wouldn't be able to tell you which one is which, necessarily, uh, if the commentary was off. Um, and the graphics were off and everything. Obviously, there's some giveaways. But just like the action. And that's my problem is if you're going to reward Dillashaw for coming forward and throwing, fine. There's a consistency to that, at least. But how do you score one of those rounds for Cruz and not the other? Because it's the same thing. That judge, terrible. This is an example of... People, people don't look at scores a lot in fighting. They look at, like, they got the right winner or they got the wrong winner, whatever side of the of, of the argument you're on. But at the end of the day, the score is important. We have to understand the consistency of judging. If a fight is 30-27 and you score 29-28, it doesn't matter if you score it for the, for the, the correct winner. You scored it wrong. Uh, similarly, in this case, like I don't under I don't understand how a 49-46 win for Dillashaw is possible. 49-46 for Cruz is possible, although still I would say somewhat of a bad score. I get it though. I think it would probably be the fifth round going to Cruz, which I did not score for Cruz. I scored it for TJ. Um, but at least there was differences there. Like the fourth and fifth round are not the same round. Um, one and two are the same round. And either they're both Cruises or they're both Dillashaws. There's not room for a split there. And that's terrible. Which brings me to my whole thing about how you enjoy fights and the differences. Alright, so for me there's basically three phases of the fight to enjoy. Number one is the breakdown. This is before the fight happens. This is looking at these two comparative skills and how they're how they match up, who you think's gonna win. Developing that opinion, like why is fighter A going to beat fighter B, and you do your prediction video or your column or whatever. If you're involved, uh, if you wish to be involved in the whole media process of the fight, I suppose. And if you're not, you just come up with it in your head and maybe tell a couple friends or whatever, or maybe you ignore it entirely. This this, this phase may not exist for anybody for for some people. Then you have the second part of this phase. And this is the phase that a judge shouldn't be in. And that is, you have preconceived notions of who you want to win, be, be, it, be it because you, you really like one fighter or you really don't like another fighter. Like, for example, for me, when I say Abel Trujillo fight, who's a guy that I think personally and as a fighter I don't care for. Uh, it doesn't mean that he can't win fights. It doesn't mean that I don't recognize the skills. But, you know, whether I picked him or not, I'm always sort of cheering against him. And that can color your vision. Like, this is the thing. All of these colorments are fine. However you enjoy watching the fight is your business. And you enjoy it. And do it as you want. If you're a Just Bleed guy who really refuses to score takedowns and stuff, go ahead. 
Uh, if you're someone who's more interested in the technique like me, that's great. If you're rooting for one fighter to the point where you can't see what he did wrong and what the other fighter did right, that's fine as well. What the problem is is when these preconceptions lead to us believing so passionately that we state things, or if we're a judge and we rob a fighter of the ability to win a fight. Condit versus Lawler, good example. I scored rounds one through four for uh, Carlos Condit, round five for Robbie Lawler. Round two, I could see the the round where Lawler dropped Condit. I can I can see that going the other way. Um, I'm fine with that. I'm I'm fine with a 48-47 Condit or a or a 49-46 Condit scoreline. I'm also fine with a draw because the fifth round was the most definitive round. So you can score that 10-8. If you give the second round to Lawler as well, that's a draw at a 47-47. A Sorry, I'm just very draw dry throat right now. But how you construe the scores that we saw with Lawler winning is hard for me to get around. Um... And the argument I've heard from people, because I've had the a discussion, like, I, I, oh, I want to understand people's perceptions, is that Lawler hit him harder. Okay, what is our basis for that on? It's a preconceived notion that Robbie Lawler hits hard and a preconceived notion that Carlos Condit doesn't. One, I don't really know if this is even a correct preconception, because if you really think about it, Carlos Condit has knocked out a lot of people and clearly does hit reasonably hard. Like, guys who have not really been finished, have been finished by him. DHK is a really tough guy. Condit dealt with him. Dan Hardy is a really tough guy. Condit dealt with him. There's an undeniable power to Carlos Condit's ability to hit you. There's an undeniable power for Robbie Lawler. And it probably is one for one a favorite for Lawler. The problem is, is that that preconception needs to go out the door if you're judging a fight. Notice I judge and not enjoy. You can have whatever preconceptions you want when you are enjoying a fight. But if you're being paid to judge the fight, or you're trying to give an, a, an actual commentary on how the fight went, you have to be able to disguise any preconceptions you have, any emotional attachment, any passion towards the fight. It's an analytical study. And the problem is, is that during the fight, Robbie Lawler dropped Carlos Condit once. Carlos Condit dropped Lawler, Robbie Lawler once. Condit dropped in the first round. Lawler dropped, in, dropped Condit in the second round. From that, and the reactions of Condit getting hit, and the amount of power it seemed to be twerking on Lawler's punches, sure, it does seem Lawler hits slightly harder than Condit. But it's not to the point where it can make up for the fact that Carlos Condit was grossly, for the first four rounds, outlanding Robbie Lawler. It's like, the way people are trying to justify this is, Robbie Lawler hits you like a baseball bat. Carlos Condit, it's a pillow. That's not what it is. Carlos Condit hits hard. Robbie Lawler hits probably a little harder. But it's not... If Robbie, like if I had the choice of taking one punch from Robbie Lawler or four punches from Carlos Condit, which was the ratio in some of those rounds, I will take the one punch from Robbie Lawler. It's not a four-for-one thing. We're, again... You're, be, you're being blinded by the concept that this guy hits a lot harder than this guy with no evidence within the actual fight itself to handle that. It works if... Um, I'm trying to fight, think of a fight that's a really good example of the quantity versus quality argument actually coming through. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I'm going to throw... I'm going to hit you with a hypothetical. Let's say Dominic Cruz goes up to 145 pounds and fights Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor has an undoubted amount of power and ability to time things and ability to hurt you with one punch that Cruz does not have. Cruz does not throw to knock you out. Cruz throws to point fight. And let's say that fight happened. And let's say that throughout the fight, Cruz didn't use his wrestling because that probably would complicate things. But let's, let's assume for a moment this is a pure stand-up bout and somehow it makes it to a decision. Let's say Cruz outlanded McGregor. But let's say McGregor hit him and stumbled him and maybe knocked him down and stuff. Proof that when McGregor hits Cruz, it means a lot more than when Cruz hits McGregor. You could give it to McGregor. You could do that. 
but there's nothing in the Lawler Condit fight that proved that either was able to hit, hit hurt each other, particularly more than the other one, up until the fifth round, which again is Lawler's round. If you want to give, like, you can give Lawler that round, but that's also the round in which the landing percentages, or not percentages, but the, the quantity of landed shots was actually the same. I think Lawler actually edged him out. I don't know if he did, but fine. You know, they were they were better shots, perhaps. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the fight was that way. It doesn't mean, you know, you have to you have to leave your inhibitions at the door when you're talking about who won the fight in any meaningful manner. If you want to enjoy, you want to cheer, that is your business. But like this is the problem with with judges is in MMA right now is they don't seem to be able to separate that reality from their job. They listen to the fans cheering and whatever and influencing their decision possibly or they think of themselves or they have that preconceived notion this guy hits harder than this guy therefore he will win or this guy's supposed to win. You know the champion bias of you have to beat the champion which is nonsense. Especially if you win as convincingly as Condit. I mean, if it did, if 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 all those rounds were close, we gave to Lawler because Lawler's a champion. Fine, but Lawler lost three rounds, and there's no way around that. It's my opinion. You might have a different one, and I'd be happy to debate it with anybody. But that's it, to me. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed. Um, give me feedback in the comments. Um, anything you want to talk about? Uh, again, I'm always up doing videos that aren't just prediction videos. I can talk about things that people want to hear my thoughts on about within fighting um, or even other sports. And if you like the, the recap type of video, um, if it gets enough feedback, I'll do I'll do more. Um, I'm not gonna guarantee one every fight. I don't even guarantee a prediction video every fight, um, but I'll do my best. So, enjoy, and uh, peace out.